G'day everyone, good evening. Uh, Michael Beresford here from Open Court with my partners in crime. Al Lewison. And Cam McClellan. Hey guys. We are here for our, uh, our second Open Corp uh, Facebook Live Q&A. So Q&A, that's exactly what it is. We're here for you guys. Uh, there's about 75 years of collective property knowledge in these three heads. We want to give, give you guys as much as we possibly 60, can. 60, 10, 5. <laughs> <laughs> Straight in. <laughs> Thank you, Al. Um, uh, good to see that the theme of, uh, of taking, uh, taking the mickey out of me has, uh, has continued from our first one. But uh, thanks to everyone that shared some feedback with us from our, our first Q&A. Uh, it was great to hear. Um, we really enjoyed it. And uh, we've got a bunch of great stuff to go through tonight because Absolutely. Yeah. the last two weeks have been the most exciting two weeks in the last three years in the property industry. Uh, we've had three major kind of events go on. We had the, uh, the election. Uh, a bit over a couple of weeks ago, um, APRA have revised their, um, their lending guidelines uh, or the buffers with the, uh, with the banks. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then finally on Tuesday, the, uh, the interest rates came down. So happy days for everyone involved in property. Oh, there's a fourth one. The negativity from the media has subsided. Yeah. So uh, that's the fourth one in the yeah, mix there. It's amazing to see there was one, one news uh, media outlet that had within the same, or was it eight hours, had... Sydney Melbourne prices set to plummet, and <laughs> literally two feeds up. Sydney Melbourne prices will stabilise. <laughs> yeah, so they continue confidence. Gotta love them. Yeah, you've got them. clearance rates are through the roof, so which is good. Sixty percent odd there. What have we got, guys? We've got uh, a few uh, questions coming through. How do I find this video, Danny? We'll change the scenery, boys. I'm hitting refresh, and it's not. Uh, it's we not have, popping. We have got to change the scenery. Change the scenery tonight. We have got a change of scenery, yes. So, um, we are in the, uh, in the Open Corp uh, headquarters in our video room, where we uh, film... In the studio. In the studio. studio. Oh, I'm sorry. In Al. the studio. We're in the video studio. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and last time we were, uh, we were actually out in, uh, in our kitchen area. We're not out there tonight, um, because we've actually got a, a local sporting club. Uh, they've got about 50 or 60 people coming in to, uh, to basically get educated. And uh, and hear about our uh, our, san you know, our introductory uh, property insights presentation. Learn about how uh, how we invest in property, open corp style. So uh, the team's out there in the uh, in the kitchen, or they will be at uh, kicking off at seven o'clock. So give us some feedback. Let us know what it's like, and um, yeah, we'll go with what's best. So you just talked earlier, Voz, about uh, three of the big things that have happened in uh, property spheres, I guess, in the last two weeks compared to, I guess, what the last three years have been like. Let's start with the first one of those, in your opinion, which we're talking about the election here. And mm -hmm. there was obviously, last time on the live, we talked about what happens, Labor government comes in, negative gearing goes away, what does that mean for investors and grandfather rules and all these things we talked about. Yep. Come the day after the election, we said the sun would come up, it certainly came up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in property in property <laughs> respects. But Boz, t talk us through, I guess, what that... Um, what that means in terms of the first piece of good news in the last two weeks. And we so, should premise this, we, we don't like to get uh, too too negative or too political in any point, but it's good to understand what the policies are leading into an election, but more importantly, what happens after the election. Yeah, so the, uh, the election was good news um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I think more generally, it just talks to the fact that markets are driven by consumer confidence, okay. right? Yep. And uh, the continuity of the same government as we said, overnight, literally, the mood from the Friday the 17th to uh, Monday the, the 20th um, was completely different where everyone just went, oh right, it's status quo. Mm. Humans hate change. There was no change. Comfort factor goes through the roof immediately yeah. and we're off and running. Okay, so that was the, uh, that was the key thing. Um, I think the, uh, the second thing that we learned from that is that along the lines of humans don't like change, don't try and change everything at once. Yeah. So <laughs> there, was, uh, there was basically um, all of these, Labor had tried to, to talk to all of these different minority groups and sectors on change and how they can improve it. It became too overwhelming, people didn't understand it. Yeah. Uh, people get fearful about what they don't understand. Uh, and as a result, you know, voted with their feet and, uh, and coalition pretty much from the moment the, the counting started, we're, uh, we're in front and it was over pretty quickly by about 9.30. Yeah, I was surprised so, at, uh, at footy on, uh, on the weekend, at the kids' footy, when I was t just generally talking to a few of the local parents there and they would openly share their, you know, their preference in the election. 
And one thing that I didn't um, click with early enough on, which to understand why the voting might have gone largely one way, is obviously the baby boomers were getting knocked around with the franking credits. Yep. And what a number of them did, while they didn't actually understand entirely what was going on with the franking credits, they just had that gut feel, don't screw my parents over. So it wasn't just the baby boomers vote that got knocked around, it was obviously the general population, and anyone who's got parents basically. And I think it. one of the big policies was they talked about abolishing negative gearing, obviously, or the grandfather rule was there, but only on new property you'd get negative gearing going forward. <clears throat> and I looked at that afterwards, you know, the result obviously we talked about, but I thought everyone who might not own a property yet has aspiration at some point of owning a property or getting ahead in life. And I guess those people as well were like, well, I don't really understand it, but take the rules away from me. Mm. And that's something I would have the chance to do. So all those things compounded together to, I guess, really, as I said, too much change, <laughs> just push them out. And the result is, is certainly positive for property investors anyway. Yeah. And I think um, if we're talking specifically about property investors, the um, uh, Labor had targeted quite a few of the minority groups or sectors within our industry. So uh, Labor were blatant. Yes, we'll adopt every recommendation from the financial services and mortgage broking um, yeah. uh, Royal Commission. Uh, there was no kind of, you know, uh, floor space for the brokers to represent themselves and, and have a right to reply. It's just, we'll, we'll do this. So they alienated all the brokers. Um, obviously, the investors with negative gearing, the retirees, as you said. So you start to alienate many minority groups and yeah. pretty quickly you get to a majority of some sort. So for us as investors, it's fantastic. Um, you know, mortgage brokers for the near term are here to stay and continuing to provide the value that they do. Um, and that's only increased, obviously, with the news that we had uh, 48 hours ago with interest rates coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there'll be a lot of refinancing activity. Uh, some of the big banks um, didn't pass on uh, in full the rate cut. Um, so, yeah. you know, that'll, that'll provide some, some yeah. other opportunities for brokers to get clients a good deal. Um, and for us as investors, from a confidence perspective, I think it did a lot to show that any political party in the foreseeable future that tries to reverse negative gearing or change it in some way mm. is going to be really up against it. So for anyone that's kind of been on the fence, I know I've lost count, probably nine or ten this, this week, um, yeah. people I've spoken to that have all said the same thing. I didn't really understand what the negative gearing changes meant, even though I had it explained, it, w it wasn't really making sense. The fact that it's here to stay and the fact that it's here yeah. to stay for the foreseeable future, yeah. they're, they're yeah, back in. And I think what happened on the, the Sunday after the election was that they got the negative gearing discussion, they poured petrol in it, and they set fire to it, and they said, that's one we never have again, that, that's gone, because I think Labor would be pretty, and they might do it, <laughs> but in my opinion, <laughs> in my opinion, it'd be something that'd be um, you know, a bit out of left field for them to go and try again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, obviously consumer confidence is back with just the status quo humming along was, and then obviously the other big one, which was probably, to me, it was better news for um, investors, people wanting to get into the property market or build their portfolio, is obviously the lending regulations and the discussions right there, or the instruction from APRA to the lenders and the required response within the time frame. I think, if you got that? I think that's a big one to expand on, probably to yeah. go back and expand on that further from Cam is, what does it mean? Because even people in our office who know it and live it and breathe it have struggled to go, well, what does it really mean, the changes? And We've had to do you go and talk to, talk <laughs> yeah. to everybody out in the, in the street and they st still struggle when you explain it. So, Boz, what's, what's the simplest way I can put it to Yeah, yeah and, and just, just for viewers, um, the interest rate um, reduction, fantastic, but that's not going to make the big difference to your borrowing capacity. What Boz is going to explain to you now is going to be the big hitter for you. Exactly right. So, um, the, if we go back to two and a half years ago, um, investor activity in Sydney was rampant. Um, the number of uh, prop or the percentage of properties purchased in Sydney for investment purposes was 60%. So um, national average is more like 35. So there was a really big disparity there between the, um, uh, the percentage of, of investment properties being uh, bought in the most expensive market at the top of the cycle. Banks, government, everyone identified that that was a risk and they thought, right, how do we put the handbrake on it as quickly as possible? And the sledgehammer came in and APRA basically gave the banks uh, two guidelines. The first one was that they said that you had to bring, uh, all of the banks individually had to bring their percentage of their loan book um, on interest only loans under 30%. Yep. <coughs> uh, so what we saw there straight away was um, principal and interest rates going through the floor, interest rates staying where they were or slightly increasing. Uh, and so what that did was anyone that was interest rate driven mm. um, went straight to P and I loans and didn't necessarily factor in the fact that principal adds a lot of extra holding yeah, costs. 
So the smart people stayed interest only, even though uh, even though that was um, uh, those changes had come in. But that meant that that uh, all the banks were down under that thirty percent cap within six months. It so quick, it happened it? really fa- yeah, really fast. They did well. They responded well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the the second one was that they said, right, we're going to make it so much harder for people to borrow money. So the easiest way to reduce the number of people that can buy a million dollar property <laughs> is to add these massive buffers onto the calculators in terms of what they're trying to, to borrow. So um, without getting too technical, uh, if we've got um, interest rates at between three and a half and four and a half percent, anyone trying to borrow money was being assessed pretty much across the board at 7.25 percent P and I. So let's think about that. If you've got a mortgage repayment that's say 3,000 a month, in the bank size to get any more debt, you had to be able to um, service your existing mortgage with six thousand dollars a month. Wow. Now that's double, yeah, right? <clears throat> now that's double post tax. So if we add that up and say, right, that's thirty six thousand dollars a year. Long story short, just to service the debt that you could have borrowed in February twenty seventeen, in March twenty seventeen, you needed a fifty grand pay rise. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So effectively, what that did was take the uh, the number of borrowers from this many this to this yeah. many. <laughs> and, um, and as a result, supply and demand, you know, we've seen median house prices come back, um, not through any economic activity or GFC or recession like- um, Man-made, artificially created. Yeah, yeah, yep. it's just people can't borrow enough to buy above the median, so naturally the middle value will adjust backwards. Yep. I think the economy felt that, which was quite clearly the response from the economy. So obviously when building slows down, everything else slows down. And retailers have hit, hit hardest, uh, talking to people in the white good industry, that's yeah, mm. basket case, so they're pretty happy with the building industry starting to kick along again. Yeah. Before I talk about what the changes are and how it's gonna help people, um, Trevor, welcome Trevor. Trevor is also a big fan of your specs. Oh, thanks, yeah. Trevor. It makes me look more intelligent, I think. <laughs> they're, they're just clear glass. There's no, they don't do anything. If they had long hair, it looked like the guy out of Wayne's world. You know, the, <laughs> hey Garth, hey Wayne, party on. I'm with you. Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> um, so the, the news that, uh, that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago was that uh, APRA wrote to the banks and basically said a standard assessment rate of 7.25%, for example, doesn't work these days. Everyone's on different rates with different products. And yes, we acknowledge that they were too excessive and they did their job far smarter, uh, far quicker and far better than, than what we'd actually hoped. Um, and as a result, the recommendation is that the banks add a, a consistent loading on top of what the actual rate is. So let's say that the, the interest rate that you were getting uh, on Monday was 4% and the recommendation that APRA and the banks agree on, which is the process they're in at the moment, so no announcements have happened. Let's say it's a 2.5% loading. Yep. Um, still plenty of buffer, right? So it's not, it's not the floodgates aren't opening, it's still prudent lending. Um, but you'll be assessed at six and a half percent rather than seven and a quarter percent. And that was yep. the difference when that's what they wanted to at the start. It just wasn't read well or wasn't adjusted throughout the process. So it got set at seven and a quarter. Yeah. And as interest rates came down, it stayed at seven and a quarter in the servicing calculator. So if um, just to quantify that for people, so if um, uh, if you had a, a single loan um, of you know average kind of amounts, then that would increase your borrowing capacity by about one hundred and fifty grand. Okay, so if you had a borrowing capacity of four hundred thousand uh, dollars, with this change, um, if it came, if seven point two five came to six and a half, it it'd increase your borrowing capacity up to five fifty. Now, the reason I said Monday it was for very good reason because on Tuesday the interest rates came down. The so point, what was four percent is now three point seven five. What could have been six and a half is now six and a quarter, mm. and there are another one to two. Uh, interest rates cut forecast over the next six months or so. Yes. So effectively what we, um, to summarize all of that, there are massive um, increases in the number of buyers that can now come back into the marketplace. There's all this pent up demand. A lot of our existing clients are definitely in that boat because uh, the more debt you have, obviously the more these excessive buffers compound and impact you, but the quicker that it brings you back into the market as well. So. Um, we're definitely in property for the long term, um, but no doubt there'll be a short term kick based on pent up uh, demand. So if we use back some in real, real interest rate numbers and someone in the office that we know, he, he's got an interest rate at 3.64%. This is pre Tuesday. So on Monday morning, his interest rate was 
So what you're suggesting to make it really clear is that he was assessed, despite having a 3.64 percent interest rate, assessed at 7.25. Correct, yeah. And with these changes they're making, on Monday he would have been assessed at 6.14, mm-hmm. and that will now come down to 5.89% because they've got to add the buffer of 2.5. So Which, all of a sudden we start to get some momentum back, and what's the reason for it and why the bank's putting the buffers there? It's because we're trying to underwrite our economy, make sure the banks are robust and stable and yeah. supportive and the structure there to make us strong in the long term makes sense, mm. but at a sensible ratio rather than adding 4 and 5% to the interest rate. So those buffers are in place. But as the rate drops come in, we benefit from those at the same time now against the buffer as well. Because if you look at pre-election, the RBA met and they said no changes. And I guess being a bit sceptical, I sit back and look at it and go, well, any change they made anyway wouldn't matter because people can't get the extra money because they're assessed yeah. at 7.25. Those changes have been changed now, and going forward, their cuts will impact people yep. and drive the stimulus in the economy so, they so want. So the key yeah. takeaway for anyone out there who's got a slight interest in investment property, go and get a borrowing capacity done. 100%. To, to find out what you can borrow. And I do that every six months anyway, just going and get another borrowing capacity done just to see what I can... Yeah. Well, that's a good point. The last and two weeks will be chalk and cheese, won't they? Yeah. 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 From yeah. two years yeah. ago till this week, it's a very different landscape. Yeah. Yeah. And the one other thing I'd say is, is see your broker, because they will give you a landscape across all the lenders. Um, all of the banks aren't the same with, you know, we're talking generally about what's happening here. Um, every bank isn't the same. So to work out how you can maximize that result, see someone that works across a uh, range of lenders yeah. and his experience with investment, that's I, really important. I was going to say, um, not, and I'm probably being a little bit harsh to most brokers here, but that's the reality of the situation is the majority of brokers are fantastic at doing primary place of residence. If you want to find a good broker who understands the structure for investment, make sure you get a referral from someone. That broker needs to, basically 90% of their work just needs to be investment because they understand the structure. So if you haven't got a broker who does lots of investment, uh, send Boz a direct message and you'll be able to put you in touch with someone. So referral is the best way. And we don't get anything from that, but we're in the right direction. So we're starting to, uh Starting to get some uh, some great questions coming through, guys. Keep uh, keep, keep typing right, them in. We'll stop talking. Um, there was uh, <laughs> there was uh, welcome, Adrian. Adrian uh, was wondering if Oakland Corp do finance. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, our brokers are investors. They understand the structures that we are talking about. And probably to Kevin's um, point, all brokers were not created equally. So it's important <laughs> that you make sure the broker you're dealing with understands a what you're trying to achieve, b investment loans, yeah. and see the right structures. I think uh, yeah. we've done a couple of videos, and Boz has done a couple of good ones on Finance 101, which is just uh, ensuring no cross collateralization, <laughs> making sure you've got buffers sitting there. Check out the YouTube channel, subscribe to that. There's 300 videos on there. But um, Kate, uh, welcome Kate. Uh, Kate asked a great question. How quickly do we expect that recovery to occur? Um, Almost instantly. We've we've seen it straight away. Do you want to talk about your real estate agent situation and the sales locally Uh, from last weekend? Which one was I telling you about? The The email you sent me about the, the sales around where you are. The sales results. Oh, the sales results. Yeah, so yeah. five from five from five mm. auction results, which you just wouldn't get before. Before that, um, the local agents and once again, I know a lot of the local agents around where I live, so yeah, just talk to them casually. But uh, beforehand, they weren't putting things to auction. They went to auction hoping for a good result in the election, and what came out of it was uh, five for five for one agent sold. So it was uh, well done, Noel Jones. I'll give you a plug there. Yeah. So, so across <laughs> the board, though, I'm hearing from lots of agents uh, the change almost instantly from the Sunday morning after election was email inquiries ticking through, open for inspection numbers are up, clearance rates are up, yeah. uh, properties that's out on the market for months at a time have now started to move and get interest. So um, instantly what you're seeing is a spark into the economy, onto the property market, but it's at a good point at the right moment because sellers aren't having expectations up here. Mm. They're, they're understanding where the market's at. Buyers are coming back, so it's a really probably balanced market. It's what I'm seeing and hearing from people yeah. right now. Well, the only thing holding the market back was the lending restrictions. Yeah, and and people, you know, people don't take action when there's uncertainty, and there was a lot of uncertainty around lending and the election and negative yeah. gearing, a whole range of things. Yeah, I just um, came out of Brisbane um, last night. I went up there to catch up with a few um, builders and developers, and went to the Origin game last night. So I didn't need my specs actually for the Origin game, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, the sentiment up there, and they've seen the momentum straight off the bat this, in this last week, so it's good. But if I can answer Kate's question maybe a different way, and some of the key drivers for the market, we talked about it last month, I think, mm. were uh, historical high um, population growth numbers coming in, historical low rental vacancy rates, almost unanimous across the country. Um, what all of those things start to do, it's a supply and demand market, is there's just an increase in demand 
and a limit in supply. So supply's been down because developers can't bring product to the market. Mm. When developers can't bring their product into the market, what happens is they don't start it, obviously. Buyers are still coming in, shortage of property. So there's a pent-up demand at the moment, and I think what the banks are doing is clever, is that they're slowly trying to bring that yeah. um, supply and demand back, or flexibility of, of borrowing to people. They're not going to open the floodgates and say, go berserk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're just trying to slowly get it happening because yeah. That pent up demand is absolutely building up in the background due to those factors. Yeah, we're not uh, we're not saying there's going to be a, a sharp increase in pricing, but uh, I'm getting in at this point and watching the growth happen from here on in. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just to what we've been talking about, uh, g'day, Miles. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, Miles typed this about five minutes ago, so we touched on some parts, but interest rates have come down, uh, but are the banks still holding back on credit slash lending after the Royal Commission? Will they loosen the belt soon? So just to put that into context, um, the, uh, the, the, the Royal Commission part um, has basically come out and the APRA announcement two weeks ago that we were talking about earlier is, um, is, is the review of that. Um, the response yeah. of, yeah. And, and uh, the specifics of the announcement were that over the four weeks through to June 18, uh, APRA would be getting recommendations from the banks and putting the onus on the banks to provide a proposal basically on what they what they think is reasonable yep. in terms of these buffers. You know, we, we picked two and a half percent as an example. Um, so that APRA announcement and what's being worked through at the moment that we'll see in the market yep. probably in the next month is that loosening of the belt that and, we're talking about. And just because yep. I like things really simple, um, just for viewers who may not be across it, Boz, do you want to give uh, an explanation of APRA, what it stands for and how they police the banks? Yeah, uh, just, just really quickly. So uh, Australian Prudential Regulation Authority is, oh, is APRA. Wow. They are the, they're the banking police. Um, and they basically are responsible and have increased powers of control since the Royal Commission to govern responsible lending across the board. So um, as Al said, we're not opening the floodgates and just throwing money out the window willy nilly. You've still got to qualify it. There are yeah. still buffers. It's just responsible lending and they govern that. Responsible yeah. lending, but sensible lending at the same point. What else we got, Buzz? G'day, Vahe. Long time. Um, hope you still got your license. Uh, given, <laughs> given what's happened in the... Uh, it's a really good question. Inside given, joke there, <laughs> uh, Given what's happened in the uh, Sydney and Melbourne market, uh, is Brisbane still the next best capital for growth factors in the near future? Yep. Great question. Cam, you're up there yesterday. Yeah, I was up there yesterday. I was surprised with the um, so Brisbane has sat basically waiting for the jobs to influx in there and the lending restrictions to to ease up. Um, but over the last two weeks, I spoke to a number of major builders and developers, and they've seen immediately after the election results uh, a ramp up in pressure on supply. So they'd had one one developer in one estate, which is probably not an area which I would recommend, but. They'd been sitting on a large portion of land which hadn't moved at all. So they had registered title stock there and they had an influx of inquiry over the last weekend. So um, now that's still not an area that I'd recommend, but you can you can see, right? So that's the type of demand on an area I wouldn't recommend. The tighter held infill areas, um, they're, they're taking off, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, the risk is sounding boring. and I talk about it a lot, talked about it last month as well. I look at several factors. Two of the key ones for me are population growth. Brisbane's population growth is spiking upwards. Second most uh, in terms of population growth last year, interstate migration's up. Uh, and the other thing that's really uh, worth watching in Brisbane is the rental vacancy rate. So the two I talk about a lot. Vacancy rates are down the last six quarters in Brisbane. Um, they're coming down and down. What does that mean? Increase in demand, decrease in supply. Yep. Start to talk about the things that put pressure on the growth that we want to see in Brisbane. Yeah, the core for first home buyers is when, and this is this is what we're saying. It's nearly becoming a perfect storm when, when rents go up high enough. Uh, first home buyers are then incentivised to buy their own place. The issue they've had is they can't get money, so they mm. haven't been able to get yes. money historically. Now they can yep. get money. The rents are through the roof, and they can get money. So we'll see that kick in. Yeah. There. So that's the first first start of the chain. To really yeah. lock in on your point, what you're saying is, I'm renting a house. I'm a first home buyer. I'm paying X in rent. Yep. I can pay that or less to, to go and buy and pay repayments. Correct. And I get the capital growth out of yep. the property I, while I'm there. I, and some of these first home buyers, we're not talking about kids out of home. You know, th these people have mm. got substantial amounts of money sitting in their bank account and have been wanted, wanting to buy property for the last year or two, but haven't yep. been able to. Now all of a sudden they can borrow, they can get their hands on that money. Yeah. I think the other thing to um, to remember is, uh, you know, when we're when we're looking at markets and what drive those uh, those things, supply and demand is, is one part. Wages is the other part because yep. they ultimately determine yep. house prices as well. So, 
people can spend as much as they're comfortable with with what's in their pocket. Yep. Um, Brisbane wage growth has, has been through a steep increase over the last 12 months with the job growth mm. that's uh, been happening uh, in and around Brisbane. Um, anecdotally, we've had a handful of clients that have uh, sold or are just going through the back end of the selling process in yeah. Sydney, mm -hmm. buying nicer houses in Brisbane for Half a lot price. less. So they've pocketed several hundred thousand dollars or a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and they've all got pay rises to move. Yeah. Yep. So if you think about what that does from a pent up demand perspective, affordability perspective, ability to pay, um, hence why we typically see yep. um, you know, uh, markets move quickly when there's some catching up to do. And we see that in, in infill pockets in Melbourne because you know, medians have come down and, and supply has been dried up for the last couple of years um, with that influx back into the market and Brisbane on a, on a wider level across the capital city. Yep. Um, make sure you get that area part of the map process right. And the weather's better. The weather is awesome. It's, it's, it's definitely much warmer. I was wandering around, <laughs> wandering around the streets of uh, Brisbane close to midnight. Aim, last aimlessly. Night. Yeah, aimlessly. <laughs> just, just a hobo in a t-shirt. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't do that in Melbourne. Um, keep the questions coming, guys, so we can uh, we can cover off what it is that uh, that you want to hear about. Uh, there've been some uh, been some great ones, uh, great ones so far. But you were filthy on the weather last week, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. You, you were moping around. No, they spoiled us. We had, we had a week there where it was what twenty every day. I'm like, oh, winter's never coming. I opened my door Monday morning. It's about one of six. That's it. It's got us. You're not Lavinia Nixon. Let's uh, get back to the property stuff. Um, Ashley, uh, g'day Ashley. Um, how has it become easier when you're still looking at close to a million dollars for a first home? It's insane. Yep. That's a that's a uh, that's great a point. That, that's a great question. So. Yes. Um, did you go and spend the equivalent of a million dollars when you bought your first property, Boz? Hell no, $267,000. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's really frustrating. I know people trying to buy now get frustrated when they hear like, I bought my first property for just over 100000 mm. Yeah, well, well, good for you. Well done. You know, don't tell me. It's like, you know, yeah. So, but it's, it's relevant. These people get into the market now. So um, probably in response to that, if you're thinking about buying your first home in a million dollars, um, there are other options of buying. I'd be, well, I'd be there's a few of this, Boz. Like, what, what did your parents' first home look like? And, you know, that, those side of things have changed over the years for what we expect today versus what was expected 30 years ago to your parents. Yeah, ex exactly right. Like, you know, I, I this conversation, it was, it was going back probably close to 10 years ago now. I had this conversation with, with mum and she said, oh, you know, the property prices really double every 10 years. I said, well, all right, what did you buy this place for? This place, by the way, is around the corner from our office, um, old stomping ground where we, uh, where we grew up. And uh, you know, she said $89,600. I said, right, well, 90 grand in 1980 and extrapolate it out. And yeah. that's what it's done over the long term, right? Yeah. And <laughs> I don't think she liked it, but what I said to her was, the truth is you're getting old. Ooh. And she just thought she'd Mums been love there. It. Mums love it. Yeah, she yeah. thought she'd been there for 15 <laughs> years. We're all grown up and she's got grandkids now. Um, you know, they've been in that house for uh, well, 40 years next year, you know, so yeah, yeah. time flies. Um, it's important to kind of keep that in perspective. But just to Ashley's question, the um, g'day Trent, thanks for joining us, mate. Good to see you, glad you're enjoying it. Um, uh, just to, to Ashley's question, the example that I use, let's consider a penthouse apartment in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. What are they? 50, 60, 70 mil or whatever they are? Yeah, right? no, yeah. a nice one, decent one. One you could, <laughs> one you could live in. Kevin, Kevin's all that I want. Yeah. <laughs> um, however many tens of millions it might be, um, who's actually buying that property? It's not a first home buyer. It's not a second home buyer. It's probably a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation buyer that has yeah. family money. The point of that is that um, first home buyers, as a general rule, aren't paying the median price or above the median price Correct. for their first home. So if you think about most people that have done it, you buy something affordable, you get the benefits of the growth, you pay the debt down a bit over time, that creates some equity, you sell it, you've got a bigger deposit and your income's gone up in that period of time so you can afford a slightly yep. more expensive property and upgrade. Um, the problem is that most people do that three or four times in their lifetime and they use all of their um, dispo available disposable income on a mortgage Correct. and acquiring an asset that they live in that doesn't yep. generate any passive income and that's where the investment strategy is really key is as you create that equity, um, buy, use that equity to acquire an investment property that costs you 
next to nothing out of your pocket to hold yep. and you get exactly the same benefit, but the tenant and the tax benefits are paying for the growth rather than you paying for it out of your pocket. Yeah, and just, just to put in a low example for, for Ashley, because and not giving you specific advice, this is just general advice, Ashley, based mm. on what I, Flissy and I did. So we wanted to live in Melbourne's inner area. So we, we loved Elwood when we were kids back then at, uh, I'm not saying I don't know your age, but when we were 25, but we had a serious property portfolio. We could have purchased that property in Elwood, it was just a two bedroom apartment at the time, but we chose to rent instead. So we paid a huge amount of rent in a place we wanted to live, and we bought lots of investment properties in suburbs away from where we wanted to live, but they made smart investment choices. Mm -hmm. That enabled us, fast forward, um, yeah, five years after that it was, I suppose, and we bought our dream home at the time. So don't bank on buying your dream home first of all, as Boz said, yeah, um, maybe think of an investment property to start with or buy something under the medium. It was like lay -by, wasn't it? Because you also discovered you hated Elwood and you couldn't live there anymore and it was <laughs> great to get away from it. So it's lucky oh, you rented and you buy there. It's a transient area, there's no, no doubt. I mean, it's a lovely area, but there's lots of families there. It's not, not as transient as St Kilda or that, that type of thing. But yeah. yeah, it was a cool area to live for a couple of years. The hat fitted in, but the glasses weren't welcome. No, um, I, I had hair then. <laughs> <laughs> um, just the other point to Ashley's question, which is, which is good, is how has it become easier? Mm -hmm. um, the easier part is to do with the borrowing capacities that yeah. we were talking about before. So regardless of the pur purchase price that you're looking at, um, you know, someone that had a borrowing capacity of, say, $600,000 two weeks ago, um, in the not too distant future, might have a borrowing capacity at $900,000. So provided they have the cash flow to be able to afford that, and remember, the nine hundred thousand is still factoring in a two and a half percent buffer. Yeah, we're not we're not stretching. Yeah. You know, it's here. not it's not like it's you know eat cat food and don't take holidays for the next thirty years to pay your mortgage. You still to yeah. be able to get that amount of money, there are still significant buffers in there. Yeah. Um, and likewise, someone who had a borrowing capacity at three hundred thousand might now be able to borrow five fifty. You know, so it's just it's just increasing the capacity that people have, have got. But make no mistake, they still need to have enough residual cash flow to be able to afford that loan if there were significant interest rate rises. Um, that's actually another thing that just uh, came to mind that we might talk about is, um, I guess, the long-term forecasts for interest rates. So they're, uh, they're obviously coming down yep. um, in, a, in a downward cycle at the moment. Um, the 10-year government bond yield rate in English, if you were to put cash into government bonds, what would it pay you as a return every year for 10 years is at 1.8%. Yeah. So that's a really good indicator. That's basically saying if I fixed a cash rate on an investment. What's the government telling me things are gonna stay like? Right, <laughs> I'd get less than 2%. Um, the cash rate came down from 1.5 to 1.25 on Tuesday. Um, the 10 year returns at 1.8, they're not gonna be going up significantly long-term. Okay. And that's, that's the motiv motivator why APRA's basically said, you know, a, a two to two and a half percent guideline would be super Plenty. conservative over the next 10 years. Yeah. And if you think of people buying now with the 2.5% buffer in there, so the reason the rates would start to go back up is that the property market's moved along. Things are skipping along, Correct. everyone's happy, they're yeah. you know, making equity, very happy, making more. equity, yeah. things are great. Yeah. And they made some money. So, but, but more importantly, so um, is the rents go up as well. Rents have gone up. Oh, for investors, yeah, yeah absolutely. So that you got your two and a half percent buffer, but you're only going to chew into that as the market grows and picks up. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, so we've got another question here, which is uh, related to lending. Uh, why do people still not understand what LMI is? Uh, that's a good question. Um, what is LMI? Al? LMI, Michael. Is, is <laughs> LMI <laughs> was, was my save, is was my savior early days. I loved LMI. LMI is great. Lenders mortgage insurance. Yeah. And when do you have to pay LMI? So banks will traditionally lend you up to 80% of a property's value. And if you want to go above 80, 20 technical, years since he's had to use Technical LMI. question, I don't know. <laughs> it, I don't know. Uh, if you'd like to borrow above 80%, then you need to go and knock on the door of the lender's mortgage insurance guys and yeah. say, I'd like to borrow 90 or 95%. They'll charge you a fee to insure the finance you're taking out above the- So the, the bank's exactly. insurance policy on the amount of money over and above the what the bank are willing to lend out. Yeah. 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 Their risk I'm, I'm super impressed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Question no, without no. notice. All right, here you go, Liz. Uh, what's the advantage and why would I pay? What's what's lending at LMI nowadays? I think it was five or six grand or what? It wasn't- Use, it, use 10 as a round number. Use 10 easy, right? say, say 10 grand. Great uh, question. That's the stupid thing. Pay $10,000 extra. Why don't I just check, check some more money in or if I want to buy a six hundred thousand dollar property, or you know, why would I pay LMI? <laughs> Where did you hear that, Cam? <laughs> from a lazy broker or from Barefoot Investor? Yeah. Um, why you'd pay it is because uh, it gives you an opportunity to be into the market. So, uh, on ninety percent of my investment portfolio, I've paid LMI. Yeah. 
Mm. Okay. Um, in short, if you've got enough, if you've got a, uh, think of it this way, if you've got enough money to cover a 20% deposit plus costs, then you can either put all of that into one property and avoid LMI, or you can split it into two and have two smaller deposits at 10% plus cost each and attract two lots of, LMI. let's say, $10,000 LMI. $20,000, So $20,000 in LMI, you can just hear the, the lazy people at the bank and the brokers, oh, you don't want to pay that, it's a waste of money, etc. Think of it this way. Um, LMI on investment properties is tax deductible. Mm. So let's say that you're on the 37 cent tax bracket, straight away, right, 20 grand has come down to 12 and a half sounds in terms of real cost. Sounds mm -hmm. good, sir. Right? So if by having that second property, don't throw me off, I've got a train of thought. <laughs> if, if you have uh, two properties growing for you instead of one, do you think that that extra property would grow by twelve and a half thousand dollars in the time it took you to save another ten well, percent plus yes, costs? Yes, sir. yes, yes. Uh, yeah. And that's why LMI makes a lot of sense. Yeah, let's get back to the core fundamentals of what people who are locking on here really want to know: how to get wealthy is by holding the most amount of asset for the least amount of money out of your back pocket. So Boz's example, then he can hold double the amount of asset for paying what was it in the end twelve grand. Yep. It's the best 12 grand you'll ever spend. And when you, uh, if you're interested, we can show you this, but when you look at the holding costs on a property, um, if you're using uh, equity for your deposit and costs, if you use equity for 10% plus costs or you and pay LMI, or you use equity for 20% plus costs and avoid LMI, uh, the holding cost literally differs by two or three dollars a week. There you go. And so it doesn't cost you anything extra to hold it even after you've paid the so LMI. A little bit of an extension on it, just to use some numbers, is you can buy one property, 600 grand, let's call it. Yep. Or you can pay 10,000 mm -hmm. and buy two properties, 1.2 million. Correct. Yeah. And property grows by? Let's say it doubles every 10 years. Doubles every, so in 10 year. years, do maths, 2.4, <laughs> it's worth 2.4, yep. but I paid 10 grand. Right, Good best deal. money ever spent. Good deal. So my return on my 10 grand is 1.2 million. That's all right, isn't it? Is that good enough? <laughs> <It's not bad. laughs> take that. All right, so if Indeed. anyone wants to get specific on their own individual situation, send us a direct message and Michael can do some numbers for you on your situation. Might even do a video. Um, there you go. G'day Trev, nice shades in that photo as well. Um, so uh, Trev's got a question around market cycles. Uh, in terms of the market cycle, uh, where are we, do you think? What time is it? So I think he's for, um, uh, the property clock is what he's referring oh, to. Great. Yeah. Can I, can I answer? Go for it now. Go nuts. I've got a slide prepared for tomorrow. This is a oh, sneak peek for the people who are going to see it. <laughs> and what I was saying two weeks ago was that we weren't actually sure where the mountain was. We needed to start climbing up again to get to the top of the property ladder or get around the property clock. Uh, I found a slide that shows us where base camp is in comparison to Everest. And we can finally see where base camp is. So we now know where the bottom is and where the climb starts. And finally, the fog's lifted. We can see it. And we're about to embark on this journey. So absolutely wholeheartedly, we have just come out of the bottom slightly in the last two weeks because yeah, yeah. Um, all the things we started the show with, which were the election, the APRA uh, decision to the banks and interest rates, my fourth one was the media being positive, yep. uh, are all yeah. indicators so, that we've turned the corner and we're starting to look out of the doom and gloom. It's a perfect storm ahead. So that, that links perfectly into, uh, g'day Robbie, uh, Robbie's question, with the interest rate cuts, Sydney and Melbourne market will be bottomed out very soon. With the yeah. cuts. Yeah, same, same answer. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, keep the questions coming, guys. We're, uh, we want to keep rolling and be able to share some, uh, share some more insight with you. Um, hopefully you're finding this useful. Very good. Very good. Did you have yeah. a question you were going to ask? Uh, no, but uh, I, got, I just got a text saying, what, what's the shoe doing in the background? Hmm. Which is uh, one of... Uh, what is the shoe? Yeah, no, I was showing, nice the, showing the boys before. Uh, we've got uh, one signed by Andrew Bogart, who's over, and just to drop a couple of names. Bring it front and centre, mate. Yeah. Can, can check everyone see that? Can everyone see the size of this shoe? I actually wa <laughs> I wa I walked in with it on there, my foot. There's before. my hand. <laughs> yeah. I, w I walked in with it before, and it, it was like we're in a clown shoe. But, uh, Andrew's one of our clients and uh, <laughs> kindly gave us one of those for uh, a fundraiser that um, one of our clients is doing for yeah to raise some money. Excellent, so hopefully... Uh, but it's a monster shoe. So, so Lauren and Craig, hopefully that's good. I've, I've got a question probably to throw into the mix and I talked about my fourth important ingredient in the good news over the last fortnight is the media. Yeah. And as a group, we collectively tell people to ignore the media, get rid of the white noise, don't worry about it. Until today, I'm saying how good it is. By the way. Um, Boz, why is it significant that the media's, I guess, being positive now about what's happening in property? Uh, because 
effectively, most people get educated through what they hear in the media and uh, the media is everywhere. So um, in the general presentations that I do, I, I have a slide about understanding the finance industry and what the media talks about. The two bottom uh, dot points on that slide are the internet and social media. Um, and I say that it's really hard for, uh, uh, for people to be able to build a portfolio over the long term if they're being influenced by this stuff because it's both opinionated and instant. So you get bombarded with all of these, uh, all of these messages. So effectively what a, a, a boom or a growth cycle in a market is, is just a swelling of consumer confidence. So if there's some consumer confidence that starts and the media then jump on that and yep. it's positive and median house prices are rising and interest rates are coming down and this is great for everyone, I'm feeling good, I'm up and about, I might do something that grows consumer confidence yeah. yep. and then it just, uh, it's a snowball yep. effect. So that's why the media um, makes, such a, uh, makes such a big impact, large scale. So when things are topical, mm. they'll write about them because that's what people want to see. Uh, Paris Hilton, let's talk about her. Ra random, <laughs> random analogy to bring in. But when she was the, the it girl of you know the world, every second day she's in the paper, in the paper, in the paper, she's vanished, she's gone, she's nothing now. Where has she gone? Oh, pardon? Where has she gone? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where she's gone, she's gone. Uh, and all of a sudden, because people want to see positive news about the property market, the papers are writing positive story day after day after day, mm. which does swell that consumer confidence and it's an absolute imperative to get the market moving out of the bottom where it is. Yeah, and while auction rates um, provide, just to give you a good indication, um, some people look at auction rates as supply and demand. We really want to make a clear separation between understanding auction clearance rates. And auction clearance rates, to me, are a better indication of consumer confidence than they are supply and demand. Mm. So supply and demand is a very different set of numbers you need to look at to understand whether there's a good property to buy in an area or not, and what the future growth is for that area. The majority of investment um, pro properties, investors that uh, I know, don't buy property at auction. Paying more for a property than anyone else is not a smart investment solution. Um, and really, what what auction clearance rates are, and if you get up to, say, Melbourne, you know, 900 auctions, and we clear 60 plus percent of them, that's good consumer confidence. But people are just swapping houses faster. Mm. They're confident in their own situation, in their job, in the economy, that they're ready to purchase and move up to that next one. So just make sure that consumer confidence and interest rates, and, or clearance rates, sorry, are set aside from supply and demand. Uh, Vahe's back. When do you expect to see the Perth market start moving in the right direction? Um, and doesn't Perth uh, generally follow the Brisbane market? Uh, it does. So it, it does and it doesn't. Uh, so I'll, I'll nail off the... Um, Which one the, does it? I'll, I'll nail off the what, does it follow Brisbane or not um, quickly and then you can give us some stats on... Uh, so I'll roll out my usual yeah. vacancy rates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, all right, so Perth and Brisbane, why Vahe has alluded to those following each other or being similar is because the two driving factors in those markets are two things. Can you guess them? Tourism and mining. They're the main big drivers of the, of the, the property markets over there. Uh, saying that, the mines are not rolling out and the tourism is not exactly the same between those two. But when times are good, the tourism industry kicks in. That's the case, yes but we need to look at what mining contracts are there over the long term. So we're not talking about new mines opening up, we're talking about mines in play. Because the mines in play over a long term bring large amounts of employment dollars back into the cities. And that's what we look for for that growth. It takes three times the people to build it as it does to run it. They, they're the stats we've heard, do we understand? Uh, it usually mm -hmm. takes 70% of the population, so if you're talking about a mining town, is that what you're alluding to? Yeah. Just to crash in jobs. So yeah, so normally, and this is where I'll get into, I'll, actually it's a good time because I guarantee you'll start seeing mining town um, you know, spruikers out there uh, promoting mining town investments because it's usually come cyclical again. I don't know how many times I've seen this come around. But uh, the reality is a mining town, when a mine contract is released, you get this influx of um, population into the mining town to build the infrastructure required to run the mine. It's usually about 70% of the population in that mining town are required for three to five years to build the infrastructure, and then those people leave town. Because the miners themselves, my brother's in mining, so I understand the industry, and we do consultations for Gemco, Ausdrill, Oz Minerals, Ausbuild. Uh, Ausbuild. So, yeah, a number of different mining companies get us to talk to miners about buying in capital cities. Um, we've got a lot of um, clients who are mining uh, contractors. But after that three to five years, the way, best way to look at it is to go, all right, Sydney or Melbourne or one of the major capital cities, if 70% of the population left town, what happens to prices? It's not pretty. Yep. Is it yeah. looting? They start looting? So they start looting, yeah. <laughs> they start looting and burning, pushing shopping trolleys up and down the street. 
All right, so now, uh, so that hopefully that just confused you about the difference between Brisbane and Perth. Uh, but um, all right, so what's going on in Perth, Al? Uh, rental vacancy rates. <laughs> So rental vacancy rates <laughs> is a good indicator. I'm a, broke, I'm, a broke yeah. a I'm a broken record, but it's a key one I look at, along yeah. with time on market, along with population growth, a couple of other key stats. But vacancy rates were at seven percent in Perth, came down to about five. They're currently sitting just under three. Now, in a in rental sense, a three percent vacancy rate is a balanced market. That, that's a good market. Below three is a positive sign. Above three is a negative sign. So Perth's just come under the three percent threshold. They're at two point seven, I think it was giving stats that might not be exactly correct now. They're just under 3%. The signs are really positive from where they've come. So they're down about 4% and it's continuing to decline. So it's a market that is certainly on the up and up and one we're going to keep an eye on. Yep. Yeah. The saying that um, we're, we're still monitoring is probably the best way to put it. If someone did buy yeah. in a mining town, there is some positives because I think when they want to decommission the mine, they've got to re-employ all those people again. So the prices could jump back up to us. Well, so in 50 years' <laughs> Give time. Give you a short-term window yeah. to sell it and get out of Quickly, there. There might be a chance someone quickly yeah. get in and get out. And yeah, we've, we've had done. You get a tenant again. A lot of disasters from people who purchased in mining towns. Uh, so uh, three really good questions have come through here. Uh, Will's a, a client of ours. G'day, Will. Will, um, hey, Will. So Will, uh, Will's question is: Is it worthwhile to get an equity release on a property that has had uh, not that hasn't had much capital growth over twelve years? Um, the loan's been paid down considerably, and the rental income covers repayments. Or is it better to refinance the mortgage to improve the cash flow to utilise that in covering holding costs on uh, the two properties that he bought through us? Yeah, right. so, okay. so we just want so to clarify. I, I'd, prop, need, I'd need to ask several questions. Uh, Will, was it Will? Will, yep. I'd need to ask several questions, Will, to try and even go close to answering it. Things around where's the property, long-term prospects for the property's growth. Has it just been a bit stagnant for various reasons, improving? The things we don't know without looking at the property, and really hard to, to for me to give an opinion on. Yeah. So was the question and interest about only or P and I repayments yeah. and borrowing capacity? There's there's a whole yeah whole yeah. There, um, it's a good question, but uh, just to give specific advice, tap into to Boz to do the numbers for you. But as a general blanket rule, I'd say yes. Make sure you got a line of credit there for as much as you can get hold of. It's still offset, so yeah. you're not paying interest on it unless you use it. Get your borrowing capacity done and see whether it's the right time. To oh, buy oh there are times though, if your property's not going to grow, you yeah. may be better to sell it. Pay some agents commission, pay a little bit of CGT, and use your equity to go into a, yeah, so one step a better backwards or property. sideways to move forward. Yeah. But it depends on where the property is. Well, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, Cam, your old favourite, delayed gratification. So Fiona's wondering what are some of the things potential investors should delay instead of gratifying themselves and getting a deposit. Well, it's a tough one. Um, a bike is a really good thing. So selling your car. Uh, no, we, go on, go and say it. So uh, what did, did come, you? Come, this is this, this is where ride, I get revenge. Yeah, did you ride your bike for nine months while you were getting your first deposit together? Yeah, I didn't have a car until oh, I was twenty. <laughs> no, look, What's a revenge? My line that Cam's now plastered is his: <laughs> "Buy the cheapest car your ego can handle." <laughs> oh, is that yours? Oh, <laughs> Stephen, you don't know. It is not. Nice. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I wrote in a book. I mentioned it at one present. At a present, he goes, "Oh, I like that." I didn't <laughs> set a footnote in my four-year-old. Hang on, <laughs> it's, <not laughs> it's in my four-year-old. I wrote it ten years ago. Yeah, like I said in Before one of the early presentations. He who writes it brings it. Anyway, keep going. Delay right. gratification. Delay gratification. Uh, so what? Um, so Felicity and I talk regularly about you know what you'd have to do to get into the property market again. So Felicity's my wife, and basically, if we were trying to think about what sort of lessons, because our kids are used to going to cafes eight times a week and eating out on the weekends and uh, going on ridiculous amounts of holidays all the time. So we've often talked about, are we not spoiling them, but um, conditioning them to a lifestyle where they're not delaying gratification. But as an adult, they're going to have to look at seriously knuckling down and going, cutting out any expense that's not required. So if you really want to get down and dirty to it and set yourself a one to two year goal to really crank up, um, I would be saying you do not enter a cafe. You make your own coffees, um, get a second job. So these are the things, it's a short space of time. So I think when we were trying to get deposits together early days, I was running three, sometimes four jobs. So I was doing supermarket work at a call center, driving forklifts at multiple different places, doing laboring work. Um, I then sold my car and rode a bike. So I tried to coordinate that with public transport and I didn't go to a cafe until I was 25. So. And look, there's a different times back then, but the reality was I went, I know I've got to go really hard for a short space of time and you can't half-heartedly do it. If you're going to cut things out, cut them out hard 
and just knuckle down. Don't talk to your friends. Never go out. Stop drinking. So, <laughs> yeah. Think about every expense. The core values. You need food and water. Food, water, and shelter. That's all you need. You can buy a PlayStation and just play it yeah. in your bedroom nonstop. No yeah. expenses. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. So, so delaying gratification, if you want to think about it, go back to the core basics and go, all right, if I, I've got zero money to spend, instead of going, what, what do I spend now? What do I cut out? Go, I've got zero money to spend. What do I need to live off? What do I need to function? Do I need to pay rent? Can I live with my parents? I'll give you a really great example. When I was early 20s. Build it back up rather than chopping it off. Does that make sense? And what, what I sort of mean when I talk about it is when I was early 20s, I had friends going to live in Europe for six months and going to live abroad and travel and have holidays. Yeah. And I was so desperately focused on my vision of, I guess, not what today was going to look like, but 10 and 20 years down the track, what that would look like, that I didn't care. I didn't give, I didn't care at all because I'd let them go and do it. I had a vision. I was working really hard to do what I was going to do. Go forward 20 years, it's the best decision I've ever made. At the time, yes, it was very, very difficult to go, oh, maybe it's the wrong choice. They're, they're living the dream, doing these travel things and working abroad and all those things. Now you have four months a year off. I'll get there one day, but yeah, I have, I have as many holidays as I can handle. So uh, to me, that's the crux of delaying gratification. It's making a hard choice in yeah. time to do something different than you would otherwise do to get success yeah. down the path. It is, a, it's a short, painful period of time, but um, yeah. Making money is not easy, but you'd rather go short and hard for a short space of time, get those properties under your belt, and then live a little, you know, rather than grind it out over you know, three times. So hopefully, yeah. hopefully that answers it. That's not too harsh. There's no, yeah, there's no magic pill. Uh, Quentin's got a rep, uh, ripper question here, um, but I might just cover one quickly uh, from Robbie before that. Um, uh, Robbie's question, recently I've seen bank valuations coming down uh, a lot. When do you think it will come back to normal? Um, Bank, value, bank, bank valuations, Robbie, just use comparable sales. So they look at the way that a valuer puts a price um, or a value on a property is just based on what's selling in the local area. So if the market activity comes back, the consumer confidence comes back and prices come back, you'll see bank valuations rise. Um, Quentin's question. Sorry, just in the, oh, yeah. the, the valuer piece, yep. they're also conservative. So in a market that they feel slow, falling, increasing, their- Negative media. Their attitude, <laughs> negative media. Their attitude is slightly different as well because they wear some risk. If they get the bell wrong and the, the market drops, the price drops, they sell for cheaper, they wear some risk. So the values are going to be conservative, but in a rising market, that conservativeness shrinks a little bit and they've got some more comfort. Yeah. Uh, so Quentin's uh, question was around what you were talking about, Al. Uh, how long do you hold on to a property not experiencing the capital growth you expect before you bite the board and sell it? Um, and take the take the hit with the selling costs. Uh, yeah. He said he's in for the long run, but at the same time, a property needs to grow at a rate which makes it feasible. Yeah, I, I used to do, can I answer it? Because yeah. I used to do a calculation, I've done this a number of times with different clients who, and I, just because I had to do the exercise myself with Felicity and I. So looking at obviously what it's gonna cost. So the core is you're not gonna stay out of the market. If you're gonna sell something, you're selling it so you can get the money out of it and buy in a better place. So it's a mathematical equation and there's nothing more. If you've done your due diligence on the new area or the new property that you know is deemed better and is going to get growth, it's a matter of trying to guesstimate uh, with as best as you can with your analytics um, how much growth you're going to get that over a 10 year period. Match that against the dog that you're holding and have a look at the costs. So you've got, and added a lot, your selling costs, CGT, agents cost, purchase costs of the new one, and basically take that off the growth of the new one and go, and then match the two and go, the growth of the new one minus my cost of everything getting rid of this property, is that better than potential growth on this the dog? And things change in certain areas. So you can also go back to your checklist and say, does this property still meet my criteria? Is there still multiple employment generators, still local shops, still transport? What are the range of things? Does that brace this property for growth or not? They're, they're the things you weigh up along with what Cam was saying about cost to dispose of. Yeah, don't get emotional, get, get into the numbers. Yep. Uh, so speaking of numbers, uh, Stuart's question, uh, are the recent interest rate cuts likely to have an impact on rents and rental yields? Uh, and also on the flip side for us that are rent vesting, are we likely to see cheaper rents? Uh, We're likely to see higher rents yeah. because there's a severe shortage of rental properties. There's been a shortage of job build, build starts around the country, yeah, particularly Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, uh, as a result of what's happening with, uh, with the banks in the last 18 months down significantly. Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely a shortage of rental properties. We're seeing in inner parts of Melbourne, um, 50, 60 people turn up uh, for um, rental inspections and have a bidding war. They're bidding 50, 60, $70 a week more than the price. 
What does that mean? It means there's a shortage of rental properties. It means an increase in rents coming. So yes, supply and demand yeah. determine rents more so than things like interest rates. Yep. And obviously with, and I'll mention one key thing which I don't think people understand. Everyone looks at what's happening today on the ground as opposed to understanding what building starts are happening. So the building starts are a really big one we monitor and building starts have been low dramatically over the, the recent times. That's kicking in down the track. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That, that's going to impact us in six, 12, two years time when we just haven't got that supply there. So yeah, I was right. Is it worth talking about why build starts are down? Go. Okay. Mm. So the reason we've talked build starts a few times tonight, but the reason build starts come down and we've talked about the banking sector so what a developer needs when they have their project, they might be delivering 100 blocks of land, mm. is they'll go to the bank and say, Mr. Bank, I want to borrow $5 million, $10 million, whatever the number is. The bank says, that's great, we'll support it, your project's strong, but you need to demonstrate to us that you've got $10 million worth of sales in your back pocket, mm. that the day your development's finished, they're going to settle and pay us back our loan. Yeah. If you take that around the whole circle of what's happening in lending, the banks aren't lending money to people to buy projects because they can't value the property till three months out due to APRA regulations. So there's this whole vicious cycle happening where developers can't start because the value can't get in because the purpose can get finance. And you go around and around. So we're starting to see that that turn around, but that's created this enormous shortage of starts over the last 18 months. Yeah. And so part of the, um, if you've been reading the, you know, the, the, the popular press around why the interest rates have come down, um, retail spending and consumer confidence is down, um, the big one that we always refer to are you know, retail and whitegoods because yeah. if you haven't got apartments and, and housing starts, then you haven't got the need for dishwashers and washing machines yep. and fridges, couches, or the, 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 the carpet. So, so many, um, that's why I per personally speaking have confidence in, in the property market because there are so many um, uh, industries that are reliant on a strong housing market um, that yeah, everything will, will, will fluctuate but over the long term, um, a really strong housing sector is important for so many facets yeah. of the Australian economy. So we tie that right in and go back to the, what the question was about rental vacancy uh, or rental increase. It all ties together and there's this absolute shortage from what's happened over the last 18 months. Oh, it's impressing yeah. you're investing. Yeah, good on you. Spot on. Um, oh, here's a, uh, here's a good one. So with, with interest rates dropping, uh, are fixed or variable rates are better? Um, you want me to take that one? Take it. Sure. So. Uh, the first thing is, um, banks will never offer a fixed rate because they're being a charity and um, just providing a great product. They're making money off that and they employ people far smarter in the money markets than all of us to know exactly and predict what's going to happen over time. So um, uh, just two that I know of, uh, Commonwealth and Westpac in the last, I don't know, six months, give or take, um, had been offering two or three year fixed rates at 4.19 and every man and his dog was getting a piece of this 4.19 <laughs> and um, now the first interest rate cuts happen and there's talk of, talk of another two or three um, or another another two one or two in the next case say kind of six months all of a sudden 4.19 looks pretty expensive so um, i'm not saying don't fix your rate i'm just saying do it for the right reasons fixed yeah. rates are great in that they uh, protect your cash flow in a rising interest rate market you know so if rates were to go up at some point and a, and a 1% increase meant that you couldn't hold a property, fix it at a, at a level that allows you to hold that property. Uh, and um, uh, and secondly, if you like surety of repayment and you just like yeah, really. knowing exactly what's going out and that's that's more beneficial for you, by all means fix makes sense. Uh, but the numbers, um, I don't know the, the, the updated ones, but the latest version I know is that 86% of people that uh, stay variable come out in front over the life of the, the so, fixed term. So, so when the bank's fixing, the house always wins. Yep. But, but no, no, not all the time. But, but, yeah. but important, everyone's circumstances are different. Correct, and yeah. if there's something you want reviewed, we'll yell out. We can help you to review that for yourself and see what the best option is. Yeah. Don't try and do it to beat the bank because you'll yeah, come correct. off worse. Yeah, do, 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 it do it for reasons that yeah. work for you. Yeah, yeah, correct. Sleep at night reasons. Yeah. Um, hey, Jasmine, thanks for the feedback. Glad you're enjoying it. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, Appreciate it. Makes it worthwhile. It's terrible saying uh, here talking to these guys instead of being home, but anyway, I suppose we're not. <laughs> You're a trooper, Gary, you really are. Uh, I've got a basketball game to play later. Hey, Gary, hey, Justin, thanks for jumping on. Uh, I You're think so that's... Behind on these questions, Bob. Yeah, well, they've been flying through, mate, we've been talking. Uh, we'll try and... I think, we, I, think we've, uh, I think we've covered everything off, so... Um, 
Uh, we've been going for an hour, so if there's nothing else, guys, if you've got, got something, get it through in the next 10 seconds, we'll take it. Uh, otherwise, we might. Uh, I, I, I should tell everyone that I'll probably be here next month because I'll be on a cruise in the Bahamas. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's oh, right. important and worth sharing that oh. I may have to leave you guys to do it. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be yeah, hard, so. like to be in the boat, but you know, I'll, I'll do that. I'll take it with the team. What are you doing? Well, I'm in, I'm in the Straits. Straits. <laughs> Cam, what is that? Cam will be flying solo. Where am I going? Where am I going? <laughs> I don't need to go somewhere. Cam. You could change. You could ask a question, change seats, and answer it, and like swing around a bit. Yeah, just sort of change the construct of the company. We'll take things out. <laughs> yeah, sure, Trent. One more, fire away, mate. We'll hang on. Thanks, Kate. Who can dunk? Can Adrian, I'd like to know. I'm so close. I'm so I was close. actually I was keen to set up a comp where we slowly increase the ring height because I've got to adjust the ring at home. Slowly increase the height to see who can get to nearest the highest proper height yeah I, I can get it and so I coach a couple of basketball teams my under 12 girls are always asking me to dunk and it's, I just embarrass myself every time I can basically get the ball I can slam it and it just sits on the rim just in there and it's, sometimes <laughs> it'll dribble in but it's, it's not a dunk I, uh, I think Bogey can you, can bogey, you Trent? Bogey can dunk <laughs> bogey, bogey can dunk bogey man can he dunk. can he can go on his tippy toes if you had a dunk the size I've got it? size 15 they're size 18 it's insane <laughs> I, that's ring light there yeah I play one on one with him and I look like a little fat kid <laughs> <laughs> alright Trent's, uh, Trent's come through um, so uh, Trent and his partner I'll give you a bit of context Trent and his partner uh, Amy a ripping young couple mid 20s really motivated awesome house they live in plus an investment Awesome. And, uh, and, and moving forward with us. Hope to meet uh, one of the client nights. Uh, what is the next move for you guys in your property portfolio? Uh, Bob's probably helped me to understand my strategy better than anybody, uh, and I'll get him to run everyone through it in a second, but it's accumulation phase yeah. into growth phase. Uh, and it's something that I was just constantly in accumulation phase, accumulation phase, adding and adding, adding property. Feel and, sorry until, Boss, <laughs> <laughs> until Boss sat me down and he explained that if you just continually do that and every time you've got equity, use it to reinvest and do it, you'll end up down the track still at an 80% gearing. So We're talking 50 years old, Yeah, but Boz, years old, Boz, Boz talked me old. through the importance of your accumulation phase, short, rapid, get to a point you're happy with, and then you use the growth of that. But Boz, do you want to just talk through the principle of that? Yeah, sure. So uh, effectively, if we're talking about using equity to cover deposit and costs, then we're borrowing about 108% of the property value. So to Al's point, if we're always getting the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one, we're using all of the equity, which we need to do to start with, don't get me wrong, but we're using all of the equity to acquire this asset base when really the, the wealth comes from the compound growth. So yeah. basically, if you've got a, let's say a, a, a 20 year time frame, then you wanna try and get the acquisition part done as quickly as possible by using your equity. So let's say the first eight to 10 years are the work hard, delayed gratification, sacrifice, build the portfolio. And the 10 to 12 years after that are put your feet up and just let time work for you. See one or two growth cycles across all of those properties. And you know if you've worked really hard and, and got um, minimal net equity after, after eight years or 10 years, but you've got say a $4 million portfolio, and then you put your feet up for 10 years and four million goes to eight million, that's when the acceleration really Correct. starts to happen. So um, I actually had this um, uh, Dave and Joe from down your way. Yep. Um, they came in for one of their, their reviews about a month ago and, and um, this is exactly the conversation I had with them. So the lending, they're one of the ones that these lending re um, restrictions mm. will, awesome. uh, will help. Um, and, uh, and I said, I said, do you guys kind of feel like you're slogging away and, and you're doing all of this and you're building um, a portfolio, but you're not really seeing the benefit yet? Yep. I said, that's exactly how we feel. I felt like I said, outrageous. I said, you're at three quarter time of the acquisition phase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that, that was exactly right. I said, if you can get your next one or two as per the plan, and then you just let it sit there, this is where you're going to be. Yeah. Kind of mapped out the numbers and they yeah. could see it and it was just a different way of looking at it. I think it. the really exciting bit is, as you said, if you go for 10 years, you get your 4 million, at year 20, you've got 8 million. That's when it gets exciting for you because at year 30, you're at 16, and at year 40, if you're lucky enough, you're at 32 million. The kids are happy. Against four, <laughs> four million of debt you took out, or three million, 3.2 to get there. Yeah. That's the exciting part, and that's the importance of that growth phase and just putting your feet up to use your mm -hmm. term, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and to answer it for myself, uh, I'm still purchasing properties, but nowhere near as aggressive as I was 10, five years ago even. Um, but I've been setting up small portfolios for each of my kids. Um, Hopefully they don't watch this because I don't want to tell them about it until they're wise enough and smart enough and make sure they're not on ice and they've got prenuptial agreements in place. Not that I'm going to meddle in their relationships, but... 
<laughs> but yeah, just the, to answer your question. <laughs> we won't pre-nup. We won't pre-nup. <laughs> You're going to be that dad like when Hannah's going to the form when you're standing there with the baseball. <laughs> Answer the door with a nail gun naked. <laughs> Can you take my daughter out? I changed the light clips. There we go, guys. Hey, um, uh, we might wrap it there. We've been through all the questions. Thanks, everyone, for your, uh, for your input. I uh, hope, uh, hope you've enjoyed it. And um, thanks for all the, uh, the positive feedback, guys. We'll, thanks, guys. Uh, Very we'll much see you next time. We have great Cheers. fun doing them. Thanks, guys. Cheers.